Right, good morning. You can be seated. Just a couple of announcements. Um, I've been thinking about this. And, uh, am I in a barrel? Get me out of that barrel. Um, we have some people that want to be baptized. So if you have not been baptized and you want to be baptized, can you please talk to Dennis? And so we're going to have a baptismal uh, this month. We may do it on the Vision Sunday when we have our barbecue and whole thing. We'll just dunk you and hold you under and see if you're a man of faith or a woman of faith or not, right? And so I'm not even sure how all that works over there. Dennis will help us figure that out. But um, I know we have one. He's been hitting me up for about a year. You know, I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized. And then I didn't see him for about three months. And so then he came back, and I go, you're the one who want to be baptized, but you got to come to church, you want to be baptized. So anyway, I didn't get around to it, okay? Some of y'all never seen Nacho Libre. <clears throat> oh, I've been baptized, I can promise you that. All right, uh, a couple things, you know, uh, not this week, but next week we'll do uh, Sheila told me, got on to me, it's not three day this time, it's day and a half, and so we'll have Pastor Keith Lee with us, we'll have uh, Jared Allen, Nathan Isaacs, and a whole group coming down from Oklahoma, <clears throat> and so uh, if you've ever wondered about what we're doing there, and, and this stretches people, we're going to be uh, preaching on immortality and working with angels. How many of you don't hear that very often? Did you know the Bible is full of prom promising us immortality, but nobody teaches on it because everybody's dying. <laughs> Creates a problem, doesn't it? But the reality is there is a generation that's going to defeat death because it's the last enemy to be defeated. And so I, I'm just saying, why not us? I mean, isn't that how we should look at it? You know, if y'all don't want to look at it like that, I'm looking at it like, why not me? I mean, I'll be like Enoch. I have no problem with that. Oh, y'all... You're acting like I'm weird. <clears throat> Aren't you supposed to be weird? Okay. So anyway, we're going we're gonna to show you scripturally and break down some things about immortality and just laying out some things for you uh, to see that the Bible plainly teaches it. Okay? How many knows, you know, and I, I've, I've said this a lot, and people don't really, I think, pick up on it. How many knows you really are not going to die? Because the real you is spirit. So if the real you is spirit, then you, you need to understand some things there. And as you mature in that, then you can determine if you let your body die or not. Because it, it, it definitely can be redeemed. He's happy. I'm glad. Oh, I need to release the children. That's, that's probably what he's trying to get my attention. Hey, bud, I'm ready to go. Shall we release our kids? It's like, thank you. Now next month, or uh, our next one will be a three-day. It'll be in January. Um, matter of fact, I mean, my intention is to get Malcolm Smith to be a part of that one. I mean, we'd like to have that. And so we definitely want to extend it to have um, the Grand Poobah of Grace to be here. And so I'm working on getting him here to be with us in January. And then in March, we're doing one in Columbia, Missouri. Okay, now, let me just talk about that for a second, because people are like, well, why in the world would I go to Columbia, Missouri? Well, we're gonna, it's going to be a five-day, and the one there is going to be like, a, it's, it's on like a resort, and, um, and so the price is going to include everything, and you get to stay in cabins on this amazing lake, you get to go fishing, I mean, we're going to put a whole thing with it and show you pictures, once you see pictures, you'll be like, I think I'll take a vacation to that. And that's what we want you to do. We, you know, we want you to come and enjoy um, what we're doing, but also enjoy each other, enjoy the opportunity that we have there. And then ultimately, either in 2000, uh, the fall of 2020 or 21, we're looking to do one with Kirby and Chris Blackaby and several of us coming together and just break. I actually want to bring that one to Houston. I mean, 
You know, I mean, they're wanting to do Columbia, Missouri, but I'm like, look, we, we, can, we can do it in Houston. We can pull it off here. We'll, we'll work it out. Let's get it here. So um, pray I have some favor to shift that thing to where God lives and not where he visits. All right. All right. Open your Bibles with me to Genesis. We're going to uh, re-look at some things. As I talked about last week, this is a little different, but look at your neighbor and say, God wants you to be a pickle. A pickle. Y'all don't even want to say that, do you? We'll get into it in a minute. You can stay a cucumber or you can be a pickle, right? <clears throat> and so I want to mention and, and take some things. They are quiet this morning. How many know you can eat a cucumber and it's kind of pretty bland? I mean, you, I mean, it's not bad, but if you eat a pickle, how many know you, you know when you eat a pickle? It's got a little wang to it, right? And so I, I want to go back to the law of production. So go back with me to Genesis 1, verse 11 and 12. And <clears throat> we're going to go over these things. As, as I was going over this week, our value system and things we want to really in, implement as we're going into 2020, um, the three top values for me and, and for this ministry is one, identity, two, honor, and three, trust. And so we're going to break those down over the next three months and really push what that means because Number one, if you, if you don't have your identity, everything else is off. Two, if you don't learn how to honor in your identity with others and with God, everything's going to be off. And then the third thing is if you don't learn how to trust him in the midst of everything you're going through and learning how to rest in that trust, you're going to find yourself birthing a lot of Ishmaels. And then that ends up growing up and mocking your promise and what God told you he was going to give you. So when we're looking at the law of production, as we've been talking about these laws in the kingdom, we get it in, in Matthew 6, 33. If you put the kingdom first, what's going to happen? All things will be added to you. How many knows it would be better for it to be added to you and you'd still you having to work for it? Okay, so we should learn the laws of the kingdom. And so these laws existed even before Christ came to introduce the laws. Are you with me? Because there is a, a law of origination, and, and I want to take you into that. I want to reemphasize some things because we have to change the mindset of how we've seen the gospel. Did you know in America, the main priority of the gospel has been the cross? I want you to think about that. Now, I'm, I'm not being sacrilegious, but I want you to hear this because almost every week in most churches, what's preached? The cross. The cross, the cross, the cross, okay? Have you ever thought about what the cross meant to God, not just what the cross meant to you? Because I promise you, the cross is not original intention. The cross got you back into original intention. Oh, it's getting quiet. So I want you to think about that. But most churches, the emphasis... Almost every Sunday is the cross. If it's all about the cross, okay, then you're focusing on he died for you, but what for? Okay, did he die for you just for you to go to heaven? Did he die for you so you don't have to go to hell? What is the original intention? So to find out what the original intention is, we have to go back into the heart and mind of the creator before he ever created is that a jam going on somewhere? Oh, they're, they're getting it over there. Maybe we ought to have some of them come over here because we're kind of flat in here. <clears throat> and so think about this. Think about what you've been taught about what the gospel is about. Most of us, uh, you know, we, we raised our hand when we were scared to death because we didn't want to go to hell and, and, you know, and asked Jesus into our heart. And, and we want to get born again so we can go to heaven. That's been the emphasis and so if that's where you start, that's where you're going to maintain. And so you're not going to grow very much in your maturity in a relationship with the person that you believe the only thing that the cross is for is just so you can go to one place and not go to the other place. 
Can you imagine a God before the foundation of the world and that was his intention? That's the original intention for, for mankind? I'm sorry, but that's not the gospel. The, the original intention of mankind is he wants to know you and he wants you to know him. And he wants to walk together with you in union. And he wants to create with you. And he, listen, you were created for his pleasure. Did you know most of what you pray about has to do with you? Did, did you ever ask God, how you doing today? I mean, think about that. Do y'all think he doesn't have emotions or feelings? You know, Sheila put a post on Facebook without my permission. <clears throat> but, you know, I had Najoni laying on my chest. Now, how was Najoni bringing me pleasure? Just laying on my chest. She's not doing anything for me. She just brings me pleasure because she's just mine. I mean, I, 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 think about it. If that's how you feel, think about how God feels. Are you understand what I'm saying? When he, all things were made by him and so you're made for him. But you know, we've switched the gospel. And we make everything about us. So when we pray, it's about our healing. It's about him blessing us for, for prosperity. Everything comes down to what he can do for us. Sadly, we've kind of just made him a Santa Claus. When that's not the gospel. Now, when you understand even the kingdom, as awesome as the kingdom is, it's the only message Jesus had when he came and he preached the kingdom. But the kingdom just reveals the heart of the king. That's what the kingdom does. Kingdom laws are just really revealing the heart of the king. He wants you to see how good he is. All right, are y'all out there this morning? Okay, Because I, I may say some things that will shock you for a minute, but if you'll listen, you'll really start to understand this is the gospel. Okay, And, and I'll be honest with you, there's not too many people that are going there with this kind of gospel. Because you know I, we've made the gospel to fit our needs. And when you make the gospel fit your needs, you're going to live a roller coaster life. When it's about, because see, if you start with man, you end up with man. So most of the gospel that's preached today starts with the fall of man. And so the whole emphasis is to redeem the fall. But that's not original intention. God had some good stuff before the fall ever happened. Matter of fact, he fixed the fall before there ever was a fall. So was there a fall? In other words, if you have the answer to the problem before the problem ever exists, was there ever a problem? Hello. Okay. So Genesis 1, verse 11 and 12. Here's a law of production. People, some people call it the law of blessings. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields the seed, the fruit tree that yields the fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. Now, <clears throat> once again, what I'm trying to show you here, uh, one, let's just settle this once and for all, the chicken was before the egg. That's what the law of production shows you. Because the seed did not come before the tree. The seed did not come before the grass. In other words, God spoke and the tree existed. Is, is that what it says? Why? Because when God speaks, his words are spirit and they are life. Come on. Spirit and life. So there's a creation when he speaks that there's a manifestation of what he says. Are you following me? So we see this in the law of production. So when he created the animals in a minute, he shows it. He said he created the beast. Okay. He didn't create the egg that produced the chicken. He created the chicken by speaking it. Are you following me? Now, <clears throat> that's important because I'm trying to show you the law of production connected to Genesis 1, 26, 27, and 28. You there? So all the way up, and I, I shared some of this last night with our interns. <coughs> all the way up, you see God speaking, and what he speaks, then you see it. Because he created it when he spoke. Are you following me? So when we get to Genesis 26, 27, and 28, if you'll go there, put that up there. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image. Okay. <clears throat> then God said, so God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 
Now, once again, what does he do? He speaks. God said, let us, really it should be, let us make a man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So what's he talking about? He's talking about a man, and he's going to give him dominion over what? Over the earth. Now he's speaking, so if he's speaking, he's creating. You following me? If he's speaking, he's creating, because his words are spirit and life. How many knows when he formed man, he did not speak? When he formed man, he got something that was already created, which was dirt. And he took the dirt, which something was already created, and formed a man. So you have to understand Genesis 2 and Genesis 1 is not talking about the same thing. Because in this case, when he's talking about let us make a man in our image, you got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they're talking within themselves, and they're saying, let us make a dirt body that's going to carry our image and our likeness. Now, what they're talking about is creating the dirt body. Because they're going to be in the dirt body. Because they are spirit. Are you following me? Adam, when he made Adam, rose up a living soul. So if it's a living soul, he cannot be the image of God. Because God is spirit. Remember the woman at the well? Those that worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth because He is spirit. So if you're going to be in the image of God, you must be spirit. That's why in Adam, all died. In Christ, all are made alive. Adam, okay, could not be a life-giving spirit. Who is the life-giving spirit? Jesus. So who's 26, 27, 28 talking about? He's talking about Jesus. This is going to be very important because, I'm, once again, I want to break down the law of production for you. Because you're not a reproduction. That's what Adam did. Adam reproduced after his own kind. Okay? Jesus produced after his own kind. He did not reproduce. That's why... In the new covenant, you're saying when you're one with him, it's one spirit. In other words, you don't have a spirit, and then his spirit comes in, and y'all talk together. It says you're one spirit with him. You're in union with him. How many knows it's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but they're one? That's what union is. Okay, so you're not a reproduction of something. You are the same seed. Adam never had the image of God. Adam only had the likeness. Are you following me? After he ate of the tree, remember what Genesis says? Now that he has become like us, we must put them out. Genesis 5 says, man was created in the likeness of God. Nowhere will you see where Adam was created in the image of God. Okay, hold your place. I'm going to give you scripture today. I'm not just going to preach to you. I'm going to give you scripture. <laughs> Colossians 1. I'm taking a little bit more time because if I can get you to get this, it'll change everything. Colossians 1, verse 15. <clears throat> or first 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of sins. Would that be Jesus? Yes. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. So what it was Jesus? The image. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 2. Or verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty upon high. Would that be Jesus? Okay. Philippians. Chapter 2, 
verse 6. Or verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So what's he saying? <clears throat> Same seed. So when Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he's not saying it's two different seeds. It's not two different people. Are, are you following me? Why is that important? Because if Jesus is the seed of the Father, and you've received the same seed, then what are you? If the fullness of the Godhead was in Jesus, then what's in you? It's the same seed. Why? It's the law of production. Once I brought out the law of production, an apple seed cannot produce oranges. It is not possible. Hello. Why is that important? Because Adam, the falling Adam, could not, everybody say could not, reproduce anything outside of Adam. Now, we, that's pretty easy for you to believe. Oh, yeah, I can see. Okay, so if you believe that, then, then let's shift over into Jesus. Then Jesus cannot produce anything less than Jesus. Same seed. Come on. That's why he's called your brother. My brother came from the same seed that I came from. We didn't come from two different seeds. It's the same seed. So here Jesus is saying he's equal with God. Now we can handle that. We're okay with that, some people. But then he comes over to you and says, now you're a co-equal with me. Isn't that what Jesus said? You're co-equal with me. So if you're co-equal with him and you're the same seed, then if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Same seed, no separation. Can't separate it, and it's the law of production. Okay, so, so let's just meddle there, and then we'll go back into Scripture. <clears throat> Ephesians talks about God has given you the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the guarantee, okay? Because he purchased you with a price. Is that right? So you belong to him. Will you realize it or not, you're his. He created you. He has rights over you, all right? You thought you had rights, and you made choices, that was in Adam. So then he come and killed Adam's choice and realigned with God's choice. Which is God's choice, which is his will. Because he killed Adam's will. See, I'm trying to be nice, but I'm really telling you, you think you have choice, but you don't. Because there's only been two men that walk up on the earth. The first one had a choice. And he chose to know knowledge of good and evil. The second one, because remember... He, he represented mankind. So everything he did affected mankind. Whether they wanted it or not, what he did affected them. So if he did that in the bad, think about what Christ did in the good. And he didn't ask your permission for it. <laughs> so his decision made everybody alive. Now, they may not know it yet. But they are not dead in Adam. Cannot be. Because he said, in Christ, all are made alive. He said, well, you know, it depends on whether you're in Christ or not. Well, he came as mankind. He died as mankind. He, he was resurrected as mankind. Everything he did, he did for mankind. That's why we have such a problem with the three letters called all. Because it means all. Now, once again, I'm not saying, oh, I forgot about this. Y'all watch this. You know what that is? That's the Mary dance that went to the hospital and says she's free of cancer. Woo! I need to learn that dance. <laughs> Sorry, I usually only do that in private. But anyway. <laughs> so, so if it's a law of production, and God put this law in before there was ever a fall, that a seed can only reproduce after its own kind. So if you agree... That you have an incorruptible seed in you. Isn't that what the Bible says? So that has to be Christ's seed. So if that seed is in there, sooner or later, that seed has to produce. 
after the original intention. Okay, maybe he says it like this. God is faithful and just that what he started in you, he's going to finish it. See, we just let man tell us when it ends or when it starts. When God doesn't listen to man, God became man, so now man has to listen to God. And so what we do is we create religion around your behavior. God says, excuse me, I fixed your behavior. And I fixed your behavior so that you could come back in in union with me. Because when you're in union with me, I'm in control. Now, he's always been in control. You are just separated by your thinking. So he came become you to reintroduce you to your original intention. So that's why he gives you his mind. So you can think from the beginning, not when you were born. Okay? So in Genesis where it talks about he wants them to replenish the earth. If it's re, it means it's got to go back to something that has already existed. So when you rewind something, you're rewinding it back to the beginning. Are you following me? So why would he tell Adam to replenish the earth? Nothing on the earth yet. Matter of fact, Adam was in a garden. Adam wasn't in the earth. And Amy knows he didn't create the garden, he planted it. In other words, he didn't speak it, he planted it. And he formed something from something that was already created. So I'm just trying to get you to think. Okay? So let's go back to the law of production, which remember the law of production is put into place before there was ever a fall. <clears throat> and at the end of it, he says, not only is this good, he said, it's very good. Are you following me? Verse 27. Genesis 1, 27. Can you go there? You're going to make me turn my Bible and then it shows up. All right. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. Now, wait a minute. That's got to be talking about Adam and Eve. Because how could he look in talking about Jesus and created him male and female? I think you're called the bride of Christ. And the bride of Christ came out of him, just like Eve came out of Adam. <clears throat> so what was he talking about? He said, now you're going to replenish the earth, Sheila talked about it, with something that's going to be on the earth that's never existed before. How many knows when Jesus hit the planet, there was nothing like him? There's never been someone like him on the planet before him. He was sinless. It's going to mess with some of y'all. Okay? Was he sinless? Absolutely. So he's the second Adam. He was born sinless. So are you. Have to be because you're after the original intent. It's the same seed. That's why you really don't understand what he did on the cross. He took your sin away. It's, it's man and religion and your five senses that put sin back into your life. Okay. Once Adam sinned, he couldn't restore himself. Are you following me? So here's the question. Is it possible to live without sinning? Well, Jesus proved that it was. Because he was tempted in every way that man is tempted, yet he did not sin. Now, he didn't do that in his godness. He did that in his humanity. So doing that in his humanity, tempted in every way that we are tempted and overcome in every way, then he gives us his position or his seed. And if he gives us his seed, then that incorruptible seed, what kind of seed is it? So sin can't touch it. MC Hammer, right? Can't touch this. So if you really understand who you are, sin's not an issue anymore. Because sin has been removed because your original intention was never to try to keep from sinning. That's religion. That's Adam. Adam's the one trying to keep from sinning. 
Jesus wasn't trying to keep from sinning. Why? Because he was in perfect union with the Father, and as he yielded with the relationship from the Father, sin wasn't the issue. He's righteous. So when he did that for you, he said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put that seed in them, and I'm going to make them righteous. And I'm not going to ask for their permission. But as they awaken to it and mature into it, they don't see sin as a problem anymore. They don't see sickness as a problem anymore. Why? Jesus, not a sinner. Jesus, not sick. Jesus, don't have issues with finances. Same seed. What will the seed do? It'll produce the same thing it produced for Jesus. Are y'all with me so far? See, I really want to go deep into this today, but some of y'all looking at me like a calf at a new gate. I don't know if y'all understand that here in Texas. It's like I've never been this way before. Luke chapter 1. Let's just see how Jesus got here in the natural way. Luke 1, verse 31. <clears throat> and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. So let's just stop there. <clears throat> He's talking to Mary. And he's saying, this is what's going to happen. Um, I know you're a virgin, but you're going to have a son. And this is how it's going to happen. You're going to conceive in your... Wait a minute. Excuse me. Um, I've never been with a man. How is this possible? Right? Same thing that your mindset would say, how can I keep from sinning? See, the problem is... You just showed your problem because you're trying to keep from doing something instead of being someone. Amen. 32. He will be great. He will be called the son of the highest. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One is born will be called the Son of God. Is he talking about Jesus or is he talking about you? Both. Okay, so this is how he impregnated Mary. How does he impregnate you? Same way. So if Jesus is a son, are you a son? Same seed. So where does it start from? On the inside out. So let's just pickle you, okay? So Ephesians talks about sealing you with promise as the guarantee until the day of redemption. Now we know there was a physical day of redemption for the Jews, which was what? 70 AD when he removed the law. Are you with me? But what if he's talking about what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 17. That we will come make our home in you. And if we come make our home in you, then they're committed to the process of changing you from glory to glory. Paul said it like this. To change in you is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So he's taking you and he's conforming you into his image, which is Jesus. So Father and Jesus is in there. Holy Spirit comes, puts you in a jar, puts the cucumber in the jar, pours some vinegar in it, and then takes the seal and seals the jar. Now, don't you think about this for a second. Because we've always looked at it as the day of redemption coming. Maybe the, your day of redemption is in you. Because your day of redemption is as the place or as it starts shifting you from the cucumber to the pickle but it never happens without the sealing the sealing of the jar seals on the inside of you the process of change because now you're a cucumber and you're pickled and the only way you can not become a pickle is to unseal the jar so the Holy Spirit says, let me tell you what I'm committed to. I am the guarantee of your day of redemption. Because you are the purchased possession. 
And the person's possession is he's got a will. And he's going to conform you into his image. So he's going to seal you. And what you're looking for on the outside is not happening on the outside. But when you come to the revelation that it's happening on the inside, I've sealed it. It ain't getting out. Okay. Just a little meddling. Isaiah 9. Let's get in a little bit of prophecy, then we'll move it. Why? Because it's important for you to see who Jesus is so you can see who you are. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And the government be on his shoulders, or authority, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Priest, Prince of Peace. On the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So let me ask you something. The dominion that he talks about that he's given the God-man, and he gives that dominion and authority to us, when does it end? There is no end. I mean, some of y'all may think like, once we dominate the planet, it's over. you got to be kidding me. You think this is it? I'm just challenging you for a second. You think Earth is it? You think he just throw, threw all those other planets out there just because he didn't have nothing else to do? You cannot ever stop creating. So if there's other planets out there that don't have nothing in them, what do you think you're going to do in the future? You're going to create. You're going to fill them. Or should I say at least, you're going to produce. Okay, I'm too far. I'm going in three days. I better back up. John 1, 14. See... The reason, if you just look at the cross as redemption, you, you, you don't even have a right understanding of your inheritance, the planet, or people. You just think the whole cross is just to get you to heaven someday. You're already there. You're already seated with him in heavenly places. You were there before you came here. If the issue was heaven and getting you to heaven... Why did he ever create the earth and put you on it? That's not a very smart God. Because you were in him before the foundation of the world. So that means before he ever created the earth, you were in him. So if heaven is the original intention, why didn't he just create you there? See, we're missing the original intention. And so then we we look at life in the perspective of maybe 70, 80 years Doing the best we can till we can get there someday. No, this is the training ground for what you get to do in other places. Heavenly places. Why do you think he wants heaven to come to earth? Because it's the training ground of what you're going to do with the revelation in this planet that determines what you're going to do. I I, I can done tell I done blew out of some of y'all's minds. See, somewhere, guys, we got to get bigger than what we think. I mean, if you even look at science and look at our solar system and the galaxies, to, to, to think about the God that created everything, and you think this is it. A little speck in our galaxy. And you think that's all God had planned? Your God's not very big. But yet we, we've, we've taken the gospel and dumbed it down to now it's about heaven, hell, and this thing called rapture. So let me ask you something. In the original intent, what is all three of them about? Sure ain't about God. I promise you, it's not his original intent. He already had heaven. Hello. And so let's create this all these people and send them to hell because they ain't going to make it. Come on, that's what most of the people preach. That before time, in the, in the original intent of God, he's going to create 900 billion people, but only 850 billion are going to, they're all going to hell, and only 50 billion are going to make it. But hey, don't worry about them. They're being punished forever, but our, this 50 billion, we're going to be rejoicing and having a good time. And we won't even remember that they existed. Who 
Who created that doctrine? I promise you it wasn't him. Everybody say original intention. See, somewhere you got to go back into the heart of your God and go, why did he make me? Did he make me just so he could save me? And somewhere you got to get out of the mindset of salvation. Because it's just in the mindset of salvation, it's a rescue mentality. That's what rapture is. It's still a rescue mentality. God doesn't have a rescue mentality. God has an ownership mentality. <laughs> he believes everything belongs to him. Because he's the one that created it. But if he created it, I was with him. So it belongs to me. It's my inheritance. But come on, I'm trying to go slow, but if it belongs to Jesus, it belongs to you because you're co-heirs with him. And he is the creator of all things. So what are we stressing about? You know why we're stressing? Because it's about us. When it ceases to be about you and it ceases to be about the king, the king can add anything to you. Because it's about him and not about you. But if the focus stays on you, you're moving yourself out of the realm you should be living in into the realm of the five senses, which actually he killed through Adam because that's how he operated. And then you reproduce the same culture or the same atmosphere or the same results as Adam did. What is it? By the sweat of your brow, it produces thorns and thistles for you. It means stuff that you're trying to work out. But you get over here in Jesus, how I many knows? By the sweat of his brow, it became blood that redeemed you from thorns and thistles. And that's why they put thorns and thistles on his head. So now you can have the mind of Christ. Because the mind of Christ don't go back to Adam. The mind of Christ goes back to original intention. What's the original intention? The seed can only produce after its own kind. And so when I understand that I'm his seed... It's the same seed. I can enter into rest. Because what's going to happen? That seed is going to mature. And what's it going to look like? I'm getting closer to him every day. He's conforming me to his image. And Christ in me. To them it was the hope of glory. Which actually means the hope of the manifestation of what Father gave Jesus. And what Jesus gave Father. And what Holy Spirit said, I'm going to promise you that they're not just having this. I'm going to make sure you're going to have this. Because you're made in their image and their likeness. And I'm the guarantee of that redemption in you. Redeeming what Adam messed up. Conforming you into the original intention, which was always Jesus. Now when I say Jesus, I say Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, that's hard for us to conceive in our brain because our whole gospel has been taught us, you know, if we can just get there. If, you know, if we just ask Jesus into our heart, and then we'll make it someday. Really? Because, you know, to me, the whole Bible is written to get you to the book of Revelation. Because, you know, the whole New Covenant, <clears throat> you know, the epistles are, are letters to churches. How many of those Revelation is not a letter to a church? It's a revelation about a person. Amen. Did you know this whole thing is about a revelation about a person? Yes. Did you know the original intention is for you to know him and him to know you? Yes. For you to be in him and him to be in you? And you all to walk together and talk together and agree together and create together and, and, and create pleasure together? and yes. Something like a family. Yes. God's going to have his will. Right. And man's told us when he's going to have it. And I think God's up there in charge going, <laughs> really? I'm the one that created this. I determined. And I'm the beginning and I'm the end. And nobody tells me when something starts and when something ends. I tell people all the time, the only way you lose is to quit. So when do you quit? John 1, 14, I didn't go there, but how many knows <clears throat> he, he was the Word, and the Word was with God. When? In the beginning. So is the Word a seed? It is, isn't it? 
So if that word is a seed and now he lives in you, what kind of seed is it? Same seed. Can it produce anything besides what it holds within the seed? It cannot. Well, how long does it take? That's a good question, stubborn one. How long do you want to be like Adam? Because you're determining your maturity. Galatians tells you, you already are heir of all things. But if you stay as a child, then you're, you're just like a slave, even though everything belongs to you. So what determines your maturity? Revelation. Revelation of the person to the original intent of why you're on the planet. But everything that we talk about in our system is all about us. My purpose. My calling. My anointing. My ministry. Really? Because that's not the original intent. The original intent is about the king and the kingdom. And when you understand it starts with him and ends with him, then everything about the king and the kingdom has benefits for you. For daily he loads you with his benefits. Look at the birds of the air. Look at the, the lilies of the field. He goes, I'm going to take care of you. I didn't put you here for you to take care of yourself. I want to demonstrate how good I am. Why? Because when I connect with you and you have that relationship with me, then you illustrate to other people that kind of relationship that that's what I want with them. Yeah, but they're drunkards and prostitutes, and I know that's why I need this so I can have that. So I sent one to do it for all. Then I bring you into relationship with it. Say, now be me on the planet all over so you can demonstrate that I came from Father and that I am good. And I have redeemed. Come on. Redeemed means I went all the way back to original intention. <coughs> Which is, it's all good. Oh, no, no, no. It's very good. That's before the fall. Some of y'all don't believe that. Well, I'm going to prove it to you in the next 20 minutes. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. Let me give you a few passages here and then land this plane. For it was fitting for him from who all, all things, by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. Everybody say many sons. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So what was his intention? Bringing many sons into glory. Many sons. So if he's the first son and he's going to bring them into glory, what does that look like? It means that many sons are going to look like the first son. So he's bringing them into glory to manifest the same thing that the first son manifested. Because you can't manifest anything less because you're the same seed. So when he says, you know, who sinned because this guy's blind, My, him or his parents? He says, neither. We all know both of them did. Right? What he's saying, but this is for the glory of God to be revealed. Here we go again. Revealed. To go back to the beginning. So here this man is blind, so I can show the original intention of my goodness and my glory. That man was never created to be like that. Adam did that. But I come to reveal my glory to bring you back to the original intention of why I created man in the first place. Was to be in unity with me. To be in, in relationship with me. To be whole with me. Nothing missing, nothing broken. So if you can understand what I'm doing to this man that he's blind... And now he sees, you can get an outward demonstration of what I'm doing on the inside of mankind. He's blind. He don't see. But I came to bring the manifestation of original intention. That he walk in the light. That I'm doing in him what I'm doing on the outside of him. I'm causing this blind man that was born after Adam to go, wait a minute. 
I'm not after Adam. I'm after Christ. And when that light starts to shine and it starts to get darker or brighter, where does darkness go? You don't have an option. Darkness has to go. So what's connected to darkness? Lack, ignorance, disease, poverty. That's all part of darkness because it's connected to ignorance. When light comes, it expels that. Do you see how the kingdom operates? Because when light comes, it, it's telling you the kingdom's being added to you. Because the kingdom is light. The kingdom is power. See, all you are is, is you know, your light slowed down to visibility. Your energy slowed down to visibility. See, if you understand that, that's how your frequency and vibration gets brought up to where there's no two realms for you. Because the only thing that separates you in the realms is you've been slowed down to visibility. When your light comes up to a level, okay, this three days to see that's what Jesus did. He said, Let me show you I have the power to bring up my vibration to transform me from one realm and step into another one. Because there's not two realms, it's the same realm. The only reason you're not entering into that realm is your vibration is too slow. And the highest vibration is love. And the way that's demonstrated is how you treat one another. So your vibration will never come up. You, you will never have light come to that place that moves you from one realm to another if you can't even be kind to your neighbor. Okay, I'll do that. Tell me who my neighbor is. I'm one on the right and left. How many I got to be nice to? No, no, no. You see, you're missing it. No greater love, vibration, frequency than a man has that he lays down his life for another. And Jesus laid down his life for all mankind. That's why he's the greatest expression of love. It's not what he does. That's who he is. So if that's what's happening to you, he's transforming you into that image of love. As you're transformed in that image, you don't need gifts anymore. <laughs> oh. Paul said, you can go after the gifts, you can have miracles, you can have signs and wonders, but I got a better way. I got a more excellent way. In this way is when love is perfected. How's love perfected? You're being transformed into the image of that person, which is love. And in there, there's no limitations. There's not two realms. There's many realms. That was just one he let them see. <clears throat> and then after he let them see, he said, now, now don't tell nobody this until after I'm resurrected. <coughs> Did y'all get that? All right, so I'm going to show you how to get there. It's a crash course today. So he's bringing many sons into glory. So let me ask you something. What's the boundaries of glory? Come on, the heavens declare his glory. The universe declare his glory. So he's transforming many sons into glory. What's your limitations? Where can you not go? Where can you not be? Oh, all right, okay, okay. All right. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. I'm just trying to give you a few passages so you can really see who you are today. Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he already he predestined them. What did he predestined them to do? Okay, so for whom he foreknew. How many did he foreknow? Uh, only Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the only one he foreknowed. And he told him, I knew you. Before you were ever in the womb. So where did he know him at? So if he knew Jeremiah before he was in the womb, he knew you before you was in the womb. He foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed. So in other words, here's original intention. I foreknew you, already planned for you, what I'm going to do to you. And I'm not even asking you. That's what he's saying. What's he conforming you to? The image of his son. That he might be the firstborn. Everybody say firstborn. How many knows you got a firstborn, you have secondborn, thirdborn, fourthborn? But they're still from the same seed. 
among many brethren. You know what the word many means? It's the highest number. That's what many means. Moreover, whoever he predestined, he called. People say, when did you know you had that calling? When did the Lord call you? I mean, read the Bible. All are. Well, yeah, but few are chosen. It's because few answer the call. (laughs) He also called whom he called. Then he also justified whom he justified. Then he also. Now, hang on here. Has Jesus been glorified? So I'm supposed to be like him. But we're still waiting to be glorified. But if you already stand, it's, under, it's already in you, and you learn how to raise the frequency, the glorification just moves you into other realms. Because you're already glorified. Your body just don't know it yet, but your spirit does. <clears throat> So if you can get your spirit to conform your soul, because your soul is over here that's listening to the five senses. But if you can get your soul to line up to who your spirit is, because your spirit's already seated with him. Your spirit is incorruptible. Your spirit don't sin. Your your spirit don't have lack. Your your spirit ain't sick. Come on. So that's why I, I, I go into this every day. I say, I can't be sick because I'm spirit. I'm like, God, now my body don't know that, but it's learning it. That's what Romans says. He said, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken your mortal body, which means to make alive where there's death or darkness or... You understand what I'm saying? So I'm constantly reminding my body, you're being quickened. I'm not asking you. You're being quickened. You're being changed because I'm spirit. This is just my flesh suit. So my flesh suit don't tell my spirit what to do. My spirit tells my flesh suit through my soul. Come on, did you get that? So what I have to do, watch this, renew your, which is your soul. So how do I renew it? I take it back over here to original intention. And original intention, there's no sickness. Original intention, there's no lack. There's no want. He created everything. That's why he gave you the mind of Christ, not the mind of Adam. Because the mind of Adam starts in the garden. The mind of Christ starts. So what's the beginning? Original intention. So, see, when you're trying to find out what your call is, what your purpose is, you're doing that with Adam's mind. You know what my original intention is? Bling him pressure. That's my original intention. To know him. My original intention. To be like him. The more I do that, the more I get revelation of that, everything else is just ice cream and cake. Miracles just happen. I just rock up and things happen. Are are you understand what I'm saying? Okay. We're going to get there. This Watch. What I'm teaching you is the manifestation of sons. But you will never manifest the sonship if you don't believe you're a son. Because you'll manifest what's in you. So if you believe you're like Adam, you're going to continue to have problems with sin. Because you don't believe you're the original intention. And the original intention, he already overcome it. So I don't have to overcome it. I just got to yield to the seed that's in me that overcome it for me. Did y'all get that? All right. 829. I gave you that one. 1 Corinthians 15. This one's a big one, but I'll just give you a portion. 1 Corinthians 15. (coughs) Verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Okay. Christ is risen from the dead. So if Christ is risen from the dead, I'm risen from the dead. I'm not after Adam. I'm after Christ. Same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. So I'm not dead. Look at your neighbors. I ain't dead. And has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Okay. 
I'm not dead yet. <laughs> but now Christ is risen from the dead, and he's become the first fruits. Everybody say the first fruits. Now, if you understand the harvest, especially back in the Jewish days, they would have the first fruits of the harvest they would bring in. So if you have the first fruits, what's the rest of the harvest look like? It's a greater capacity of the first fruits. But it's just like the first fruits. It's not different from the first fruits. It's just greater in magnitude. So Jesus says, I'm the first fruit. I'm the first fruit of the one risen from the dead. And God said, but let me show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the same spirit that rose you from the dead. It's going to be in them. So now you're going to have many that operate the way you do because you're the first fruit. And you're risen from the dead. So death has no power over you. And if he's the first fruits and he's been risen from the dead, did he conquer death? Did he conquer hell? What are you afraid of? Because now you're supposed to operate the way he did on the planet. Did he get the keys of death, hell, and the grave? What can you not open? Come on, if you got the keys, you're in charge. But see, we don't believe that because everything around us is dying. But he says death will be defeated. It's the last enemy, but it will be defeated. So watch this. Did Christ already defeat it? So why can't you? If the same spirit that defeated death in Christ and it's in you, why is death telling you what to do? See, somewhere you got to hear this to believe this, to manifest this. But we don't teach this because everything we see has death in it. Everything we see has a beginning and end. But Christ don't have a beginning and end. Neither do you. Oh, y'all going to get that. See, I'm saying Christ, but you don't have a beginning and end, Penny. Because you are in Him. So if you are in Him, there's no beginning. And if you're in Him, there's no end. So what in the world can determine anything that you do? Circumstances only determine it if you yield to the laws and circumstances that govern everybody else. But if you're governed from a whole nother realm of who you were in original intention, you can only produce what is in you, which is the original seed. When you start yielding to that, that seed starts to manifest. When that seed starts to manifest, watch this. All of creation goes, what the heck is that? That's what Romans says. All of creation is groaning for the manifestation of sons. It's not going to happen in heaven. For since by man came death. Everybody say, by man came death. <clears throat> by man also came resurrection of death. <laughs> I hope you all got that. So if man brought death, another man came and killed death. Which man you got? <laughs> I like that. You not know that's right. <laughs> I don't know who said it, but amen. <clears throat> For as in Adam all die. So listen, what's he telling you? As long as you live in the mindset of Adam, you're dying. All die. Even so, in Christ, all shall be made alive. Now watch this. By each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. His coming is not the return of Christ. If he's the firstfruits and you're the fruits after him, the fruit is in you. He's saying due to the order of each person depending on the Christ coming in them, the manifestation in them. You are your day of redemption. And what do we do? We put everything on the outside. When, when he came, he said, don't do that. <coughs> he said, the kingdom is in you. Everything you need to life and He said, to prove that, I sent the Holy Spirit as a guarantee to seal you so it can't get out. 
Not that you need to think he's going to get out. But he said, I'm making a promise to you. That what I started in you, I'm faithful and just to finish it. How long is that going to take? You tell me. He's not bound by time. You are. Well, some of you. A couple more. James. Is anybody seeing who you are? James chapter 1. Verse 18. And verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Where is it from? And comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought, brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. See, what this 40 year transition period was, was the first fruits of the harvest. Did y'all get that? So, what the apostles were doing, they were first fruits. And their believers were first fruits. But how many knows it was, only, it was pretty much limited to the Roman Empire? We're not talking about the whole planet when you're looking at this. Y- y'all do know that, right? It was the Roman Empire. That's why it says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Look up that word world there. It means the Roman Empire. Why? Because the, the gospel had not made it outside of the Roman Empire during that 40 years. They were the first fruits that God was saying, here's the first fruits that I brought in. It's going to manifest in all the world. Okay. Y'all get that in the book when I finish it. All right, let let me give you this and I'm done. Everybody say original seed and turn with me to Ephesians. We'll settle it right here. We'll settle it right here. Ephesians 1, we're going to say what, how, when, and why. Or let's do it this way. What, how, when, why, and where. Original seed, chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Where? So, Father, bless you. Remember, law of blessings or law of production or law of original intent. Where did he bless you? In heavenly places, in Christ. Okay? Verse 4. Just as he chose you in him, so what did he choose you for? He chose you in him before the foundation of the world that you would be holy without blame before him in love. Now, wait a minute. <clears throat> he chose you before the foundation of the world that you'd be holy. So he chose you before the foundation of the world to be holy before there was ever any sin. So if you go back to original intention, it's easy to be holy because there is no sin. So it's not a problem me trying to be, I'm going to be holy, man. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to smoke. I'm not going to hang out with people who do. Well, we know that's not holy because that's what Jesus did. <laughs> Sorry, that's why they call him a wine bibber. That's who he hung out with. So we know that's not what is holy. That's religion's idea of what's holy. He said, I chose you to be holy. You know what he's saying? I chose you to be like me. I'm holy. Who determines what holy is? Talk to him. I mean, I hate to say it like this, but maturity level has somewhat to do with holiness. Because we misunderstand what he's saying. You don't put a 10-year-old kid in a Corvette and give him the keys. It won't be holy. <laughs> but you get somebody that's mature that can handle the situation. Then they, they're allowed to do things that a 10 year is not allowed to do. If they have to do it, then it becomes unholy. That's why Paul said, you know, I got freedom to do what I need to do. But he said, if it offends somebody, I don't need to do it. Because I care more about that person than I do my freedom. Did you get that? See, that's true freedom. True freedom is having the ability to do it and not doing it. That's true freedom. That's true power. 
Because that's your right. But how many knows there's something greater than your right? Jesus had every right to call 10,000 angels. But he said, I'm not going to use my right. I'm going to use my love. Because I care more about you than I do my rights. Did y'all get that there? See, if you don't watch it, especially in America, it's all about my rights. So you're under Adam. Because you've been bought with a price. You don't have no more rights. Yield your rights. So what's your rights? Your rights connects to your will. So Adam's will has already been dealt with. So Jesus came to do what? Jesus didn't come to fulfill his will. He came to fulfill Father's will. All right, let me finish these two. How are we going to do those things? In him. Okay, so what? We're the sons of family. How? In him. So how are you going to be a son? You're in him. It's the original intention. It's not you making yourself a son. He made you a son. He put the seed in there. Okay, when? When did he do this? After the cross. Before the foundation of the world. You were in him. That's what he was telling Job. He said, Job, where were you? And then he tells him, were you not with the sons? Praising God from the beginning? Were you not there? Did I miss and thought you were there, but you're not there? Remember, Job, you were there. That's what he's saying to Job. He's saying, remember, go back to original intention, Job. So it, for him to do that, they had to be access to the mind of Christ before it was accessible for everybody. We know that because Enoch got it. We know that because he's talking to Jeremiah about it. He said, hey, Jeremiah, I knew you. Jeremiah's like, what? What do you mean you knew me? I knew you before you were in your mama's womb. Are you my uncle? No, what was he doing? He, he, he's, he's given him an opportunity to operate in something individually before it was available to people corporately. And that's what you see all the way through the Old Testament. You see people that had the right. And that's what, that's what uh, David did. David operated in something individually before it was available to everybody corporately. Why? Because he had a heart. And because of the heart, the vibration of it pulled him in and gave him access that other people didn't have access to. So even though I'm teaching some of this stuff and most people don't have access to it, it doesn't stop me from having access to it. And so you'll look back 10 years going, oh my gosh, this was available all along and I never knew it. Mostly because nobody ever taught it. Now, listen, they, listen, there's mystics that taught this in the 1900s, but they weren't accepted by the church. So it didn't find its way into what we call mainstream doctrine because we did the same things as the Jews did back then. We wanted to be able to control, and we wanted people to come through us and not go to God directly. Because if we go to God directly, then we can't control them and we can't have the money. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. Having predestined us to adoption as sons. So he predestined to adopt us. Now, adoption, once again, is not how Americans think. You're not a son, then you're a son. Adoption actually means the same word as when he said, the heavens opened and said, today, you're my son. It means to be set apart. It says he, what he did, he predestined for you to be adopted, set apart, to be a son for him on the planet. In other words, you were always a son. Jesus was always, he was born a son. But the day came when Father said, he's mature. Why is he mature? He's learned obedience to the things he suffered. You want to get mature? You're going to suffer some things. Now, I'm not talking about sickness and all that. I'm talking about people's opinions about you. People calling you a heretic. People calling you crazy, stupid, weird. Just leave me alone. I'm enjoying life. You understand what I'm saying? I'm just looking for some stupid, weird people to go along with me. <laughs> did you know that's what Jesus did? Think about it. Jesus didn't go to the temple looking for people. He went to unlearned fishermen. Good reason for that. He went to the wine bibbers and the prostitutes. Why? They knew they needed help. 
I think that's why y'all here. <laughs> Listen, I know I need help. I'm right there with you. There's no way I can live this life. A Christian life is impossible. Why? Because he never asked me to live it. He empowers me and he lives it through me. Five things and I'm done. I'm going a little bit over today, but that's all right. I asked him. He said it was okay. <laughs> Last thing here. <clears throat> before, before I hit, okay, verse five, or verse 5. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to his good pleasure. So in doing this, it pleases him. It pleases him that he did it and didn't get to ask you whether you even wanted to do it or not. Come on, I put Najoni on my chest. I didn't ask her if she wanted to be on my chest because it brought me pleasure. I didn't care if it brought her pleasure or not. But you know it did because she was so calm. <laughs> to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us, watch this, accepted. Everybody say, I'm accepted. Where? Before him in love. You're already there. So let the love that he gave you. He said, the only reason you can love me is because I first love you. So receive what he gave you, which is a person. Let that change your vibration. Yes. Come on, are you out there? Yes. To where it gets in you so much you can't help but want to do something good for somebody else. Yes, That's when you know it's effective. Because now it's off you and on somebody else. Let me give you these five things and we're done. Did I already say that? I'm just going to give you the passages. I'm going to shut my Bible to encourage you. There's five fellowships we're going to talk about. I'm going to break them down today. Five fellowships. Because everything about original intent is fellowship. You know, the Baptists got that right. That's why they eat together all the time. They have fellowship. Sorry. You know why they have fellowship around food? Because they can't drink. They can't. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Philippians 1.5. That we fellowship... Around the gospel. Philippians 1.5. We fellowship around the gospel. Which, what is that? It, it's the start of everything. It, it, should be, it should be the basic foundation. It's grace. It's what he did for us. It's not law. It's grace. We, we fellowship because we all agree in what he did for us we couldn't do for ourselves. That's just fellowship in the gospel. It's fellowship in the word. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Philippians 1.5. These are phases. Okay? The second one. It's Philippians 2 1 is fellowship of the Spirit. Fellowship of the Spirit, then it opens you up to miracles, signs and wonders, right? You know, a little bit of language to get somewhere else. You okay? All right. <clears throat> and so you start to embrace miracles, you start to embrace, you know, angels, you start to embrace as another realm. You okay? That's another, it's another level. Number three, 1 Corinthians 1 9. It's fellowship of his son. <clears throat> so when you get fellowship of the son, you start to come into inheritance. Yes. You know what he has is what I have. I'm co-heirs with him. So see, you can kind of see, if you look at this, you'll see where you're at. Did you know most of the body of Christ is just fellowship with his word, the gospel? That's it. They don't even go into fellowship of the spirit. Much less over here with us crazy people. <laughs> fellowship of the son. We're co-heirs with him. He was equal with God. We're equal with him. <gasps> wow. Who are we? I mean, that's really what he's saying. Okay? That's Paul in Philippians. That, that one's in Corinthians. The next one is fellowship. No one likes this one. The fellowship of his sufferings. Why? Because you want to know him in the power of his resurrection and fellowship of his sufferings. So in other words, you'll not really move into the power of his resurrection without the fellowship of his sufferings. The sufferings are not sickness and disease. The sufferings are, you ain't going to believe who, what they said. It's the accusations. It's the persecutions for his name's sake. And instead of us going back trying to fix all them, you should be celebrating going, hey, talking about me again. <laughs> Woo, I got a blessing coming. Because that's what the word says. Come on, are you with me? I mean, every time I hear that I'm a heretic, I say, come on, God. Come on, let's do this. They called you a heretic, they called me a heretic. I'm right there with you. I'm manifesting you because they call me a heretic. Because I'm telling them what you said. Did you know that's when you get called a heretic? Is when you tell them what Jesus says. I'm serious. Now, if you can get to that one, then here's the last one. Ephesians 3, 9. 
Fellowship of the mystery. Did you get it? That's the ultimate. Fellowship of the mystery. Why? Because when you start to fellowship with the mystery, it ceases to be a mystery to you. It's just a mystery to everybody else. So that's why I talk things that people go, that's weird because it's a mystery to you. But once you experience it, you can't unspirit it. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Because of his kingdom, there is no end, and it's a what? Ever-increasing kingdom. So about the time you think, oh, man, this is the ultimate, then you get something else. Are you understand what I'm saying? This is where God's taking us, guys. We can no longer settle for this mamby-pamby gospel that's been taught that's about us. This is about him. And he plainly tells you when you put him first, when you put the original intent first, then you can start to understand who you are. That's when the manifestation of the kingdom starts to happen in you. It doesn't happen because you decide to make it happen. It happens by revelation that you see, I already got it. If I'll just water it and protect it and give it a little sunlight. Did you get that little sunlight, little revelation of the sun? He'll bring the seed forth. And what does it do? It conforms me into his image. It brings forth glory. Manifestation in all realms. So what's your boundaries? Sickness has no hold there. Disease, poverty, no hold there. So even what I'm going through, I'm not trying to get healed. I'm not trying to go after finances. I just know if I'll protect the seed, the manifestation of what's happening in me will remove every bit of lack and ignorance and darkness or anything that's trying to threaten my life, my finances, my relationship. It deals with it, not me. I don't have to. It says the sons fight with the enemies at the gate. I don't have time to go into that one. Oh, you understand what I'm saying? Stand up with me. Come on, this is where I'm challenging. I'm telling people, go home. This is your homework. When you meditate a little bit, go back to original intention. Go back and say, you know, God, what was your original intention of all this? Why would you create what you created? And why would you do what you do just to get us back to you? See, that's our mindset is redemption. The cross is just to get us back to him. He said, no, 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 no. You have to understand what original intention is. You never got away from me. Just you thought you did in your mind. You were separated in your mind and in your thinking. But everything's always been about union. It's always been about me knowing you and you knowing me. Fellowship and on that degree. Thinking you know what to do, but not understand that you can't get this from an ordinary man. But it comes by the Spirit, and in that it is revealed. So trust me, and you will be healed. So I am that I am, and I am showing you what I am doing and where I'm coming through. As it starts to manifest to the right, to the left, upside and downside, trust me, as I am doing what you do not see. But as it manifests, others will start to understand because they will see they couldn't get it from a man. But now they're seeing it, and it's coming through you. For I am showing you what I'm about to do. And I do it in and through you for my glory that others may see. And I do all this through something called intimacy. So understand, oh, I became a man. So you could become like me. So trust me in this place of intimacy. So, Father, I release your word. I seal it in them today as your promise. That what you have started in them, you are faithful. That you will not abandon them, but you will finish that work. For you watch over your word to perform it. It will not return void, but it will accomplish what you sent it here to do. So, Father, we embrace that in Jesus' name. Amen. We will see you Wednesday night.